Welcome back to the Lowdown on Physics. This is screencast number six in a series on VCE Unit 3 Physics, looking at electronics and photonics. Today we'll be exploring telecommunications in terms of the sending and receiving of information. So we're looking at um, how we transfer information and currently probably have three main ways that we do so. So first way is a pair of conducting wires, usually copper because of its low resistance and relatively cheap cost for the amount of resistance it has, um, as in like your telephone wires. Coaxial cable, this is what you would plug in as part of your antenna to the back of your TV and optical fibers. Now this is kind of a little bit of background and it's not going to be tested directly, but it's kind of helpful when we look at telecommunications in the whole scheme of things. So copper wires, usually we've got uh, voltage variation running through the wires. So it's either from zero volts up to a positive voltage or it's oscillating around the zero volt mark. And this can actually be a digital signal or analog. The advantages of the copper wires is it's simple and it's cheap, very easy to roll out. Disadvantages is that it is prone to interference and there are a very limited number of frequencies with which we can send signals. The coaxial cables generally carry um, high frequency transmission, so UHF or microwaves, and basically it consists of the carrying the, the wire that carries the signal in the center, thick insulate around that, and then grounded conductor like the mesh that goes around that, and that helps protect it against interference. Uh, it's able to carry many signals simultaneously, so it's easy to determine between difference in frequency, um, so it's carrying uh, tons of different signals that are modulated, so the demodulator will interpret those signals. So basically we tune it into a circuit um, and we, we pull out the desired signal. So when we're tuning into a TV station or radio station, we're after a particular signal um, that we can then interpret the information from that carrier wave. Okay, optical fibers. These are very fine glass fibers of ultra high purity and they carry light signals or infrared signals through them. They can carry tons and tons of frequencies so we can have huge amounts of information carried simultaneously within one small wire or cable. Um, we lose very little energy in there so we can send it a long distance without having to reamplify that signal. So speaking of signal losses, let's talk about attenuation, and that's the amount of power that gets lost in a transmission. Um, it's measured in decibels, which is a logarithmic scale. So what that means is that 10 de decibels of attenuation means we get one-tenth of the power. At 20 decibels, if we double it, we get one-hundredth the power. So we're actually, when we double it, we add an extra zero. So if we had 30 decibels, we'd be expecting one thousandth of the power coming out. And just another definition, which is bandwidth, which is talking about how many frequencies, how many different frequencies um, can be passed through the system. Um, so how easily can we send different amounts of information at the same time? If it's in digital form, we measure bandwidth in bytes per second or bits per second, megabytes per second, gigabytes per second. Or if it's in an analog, so we've got sinusoidal waves, then we'd measure it in hertz or kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, because we're measuring the frequency of that waveform. I've, I've mentioned analog and digital a couple of times, so let's, I guess, define that a little bit more. Uh, basically sound waves are analog signals so we're talking about a variation in, in intensity over any given range of values often we represent this as waves in contrast we've got digital signals which only have two possible values it's either on or off sometimes called high or low and generally we're talking about 
uh, as far as binary goes, ones and zeros. One representing an on, zero representing an off. So if we want to represent that graphically, an analog signal varies like so, whereas when we talk about a digital form, we've either got it on or off. Now sound travels at about 340 meters per second, give or take. Light's traveling up around 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So we can speed up conversation or information transfer over long distances if, instead of using analog signals, we convert it to digital signals. That means that we can be sending the information via light at the speed of light over long distances, so it travels very quickly. And the other advantage there is that we have minimal loss. You've only got to determine whether the light was switched on or switched off. So part of the switching on, switching off is what we call modulation. And this occurs where, you know, basically by definition, it's when one system gets altered by another. So some of the ones that we'd be more uh, familiar with would be amplitude modulation, that's the AM band on your radio, frequency modulation, that's the FM band, and pulse code modulation. Okay, that's your digital form, and that's like turning your light on or off, or sending an electric, electric signal on or off. So let's have a bit, bit of a visual look at that. So consider this particular wave. We want to send this signal wave. Uh, if we wanted to send it via amplitude modulation, then we want to alter the amplitude of that signal. So we actually put restrictions on the amplitude of the signal as we send it. The other option we could have would be frequency modulation, and that is where we vary or alter that frequency. Please note, yes, often we get asked a question in the exam, identify the carrier wave, identify the, um, the signal, and the easiest thing that we want to look for, the carrier wave, or sorry, the modulating signal, always has the high frequency. Okay, so the modulating signal always has a high, fre high frequency. In terms of LEDs, we can easily modulate um, the light from that for a signal from some other transducer such as a microphone. Um, if we wanted to do it as analog, you'd basically just be making it brighter or dimmer instead of always sending light of the same intensity. So the light would actually be a carrier then for the original signal from the microphone. So at the other end of our circuit, we need to interpret the signal that's been sent. So the LED, the light that's sent there, must be what we call demodulated. Okay, and basically what we need is another transducer up there. We need a photodiode or a phototransistor, um, which will detect the variations in light signal and convert them back to an electrical signal. Now we don't tend to use light dependent resistors because they're pretty slow to respond. So we pretty much always use photodiodes or phototransistors because they're responding pretty much as quickly as we're varying the signal at the other end of that circuit. So let's have a look at a schematic diagram. So we've got our output signal, our variation. We add that to the LED that's just transmitting a light of a constant sort of uh, intensity. What happens is, because of the variation in voltage, we get a modulated LED signal. It looks the same, except now the voltage is much higher. It's being sent as light. The transmission goes along the optic fiber. We get the photodiode receiving the signal and then demodulating the signal so that we get our original output signal returned. Now I talked about quick response times and in order to make sure that our 
the, the original signal that we sent in comes out, we need to consider what we call rise and fall times. And this is the time it takes to fully respond to the incident light. Or in the case of the LED, how long it takes for the LED to reach the full brightness once the voltage changes. So rise time, time it takes to fully light up after the current passes through it. And fall time is how long it takes to fully dim once the current stops. The signal must be the you know, must be longer than the rise and the fall time. So if we look at this, if it's got that signal going in, we've got a rise time, we've got full brightness, then we've got a fall time. If the signal is shorter than the sum of these two here, then it will not reach full brightness. It will only start rising and then it will drop off again. So it needs to be longer than those two times. So for an LED, this is a current and that's the light output that we would get. If we go to the other end of that circuit, for the photodiode, this would be the light that's coming in, then this is the current that it would generate. As that light hits, then the current increases till we get that constant current registered, the light stops and the current drops off. So what I was just saying there before, that the period for the signal must be greater than these two, the sum of these two here. So that's what it's in words there. All right, that's it. I'll see you in class next lesson.